morning. Uh, this is the uh, meeting of the House Appropriations Committee in conjunction with the House Health Care Committee. We welcome um, health care to this joint presentation from the Department of Mental Health. We very much appreciate you all uh, being with us together. I think we have about an hour for the presentation. Uh, what we normally like to do is to give our presenters a chance to try to get through portions of their presentation and try to bulk up questions um, at appropriate stopping points. So if that's okay with everybody, we'll try to manage it that way. And Representative Lippert, before I turn it over to the commissioner and let her introduce her team, are, are, do you have remarks that you would like to make? Uh, just that uh, it's good to see committee members again. And uh, I would just remind committee members that the th there will be a brief period, I think of 15 minutes of maximum, uh, for us to identify issues that we might want or need to hear more about, not just for us, but, but for both committees. And that we're not, it's not an intention uh, that the, during the testimony this morning that we engage in any type of debate or uh, try to resolve issues, but we're trying to identify uh, if there are issues and what they may be. Terrific, thank you, Rep. Lifford. And one other thing that we've discovered in our conversations with um, department leaders throughout this morning is that the presentation that we're receiving we knew was being built off of the governor's original, original recommendation for the fiscal year. Uh, what we have come to realize is we may not see highlighted some of the changes that he was proposing in at it originally, they may still be on the table. And so commissioner, if you're not highlighting in your presentation, um, some of those original changes, could you also note those? And we're trying to figure out a way to generally summarize that, but I just wanted to give you a heads up to that. And I think I've covered it, uh, Rep Toll, in terms of the things that we normally like to touch on before turning it over to the commissioner. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for starting. I. I... I thought I was going to be not distracted, but I did get the phone call of a daughter leaving for college. So I was a couple minutes late and I apologize, but it's been a long morning, um, an emotional morning, I should say. So it's very good to see everyone here today. Commissioner, thank you. And um, it's wonderful to have the Committee of Jurisdiction with us. It's going to expedite our work and um, and um, you know this team approach, I think, is exactly what we need to do in light of what is before us now in the very condensed time frame. I just did want to make aware to the other committee members that have joined us um, that next week on Thursday and Friday we, we will be holding public hearings on the budget uh, Thursday the 27th at five o'clock and Friday at one o'clock. Um, and so uh, Teresa will send out links to all members. Uh, notices have already gone out and, um, and you already may be aware of it, but I wanted to invite everyone to those public hearings. Uh, for the following week, we will start making our, um, uh, we would like to hear recommendations from the committees of jurisdiction as we work uh, together with you on either the first or the second. It would be a very aggressive timeline to vote the budget out on the 4th out of committee. Um, if it doesn't happen on the 4th, it would have to be voted out on the next Tuesday because Monday is Labor Day. So regardless if it's voted out the 4th or the 8th, we would need recommendations back the 1st or 2nd. And these can be a very informal memo uh, we just need the highlights getting across to us. We don't need to cite statute or sections of the budget, uh, just the areas um, of concern. Um, even if we voted out the 8th, the day we vote out is the date we just 
proofread and vote. And so um, all of our work would likely be done on Friday the 4th um, either way. So it, it's, a, it's a compressed timeline. It's, um, it, it will be tight, but I'm confident we can do it with this team approach. And so I think we should just jump right in now to the commissioner's, um, uh, the commissioner's presentation. Thank you, Sarah, nice to see you. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, it's great to see everyone. I hope that everyone is doing well. Uh, for the record, Sarah Squirrel, Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. I am joined here by a few other members of the DMH team, Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox, uh, Finance Manager Shannon Thompson, and our Director of Quality and Accountability, Allison Crump. And also would just note that Sarah Clark from the Agency of Human Services Fiscal Office is also joining us today. Uh, so I will be walking us through um, the detailed amended budget talking points. Um, that is what is being shared on the screen right now. I will also, per the request of the chair, um, reflect back on any changes from the original governor's FY21 recommended budget and can certainly dig into any questions that folks might have regarding that. Um, I did pull that up and, and prepare to speak to it as well. Um, so again, I want to thank both committees um, for your time today um, and continued to support um, to ensure that we have a strong mental health system of care in Vermont. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, referencing these detailed talking points is probably easiest for folks. And then you can, of course, they align with the ups and downs spreadsheet um, that you've also received. Um, so the first area that I will focus on are um, some savings um, that we've been able to achieve related to our internal service funds. Um, the first one is a savings of a gross savings of $33,000. I would also note that we also put the general fund equivalent here um, so that committee members can see that. So that is the 3,207 number as well. Um, so essentially the workers comp, we have a 5% reduction for our workers compensation costs for DMH. Um, moving down, we also have a 5% reduction for fee for space, insurance, IT, um, ADS, Agency of Digital Services expenses, um, as well as HR. Um, as we were looking at um, the FY21 budget amendment, um, given the current fiscal climate, we were obviously looking for any efficiencies that we could find um, within central office at DMH and also within our facilities. Uh, so at VPCH and MTCR, we are proposing um, operating uh, reductions focused on some equipment um, that we no longer need uh, getting rid of one of the vans at MTCR that we feel that uh, we no longer need, um, as well as a 10% reduction to travel expenses and conference expenses. Um, that also um, continues down with additional um, savings to our central office operating budget. Um, again, looking at a reduction to travel expenses and conferences for central office. Um, and given that we're you know, all operating in more of a remote environment, um, this is a very achievable savings for us and will still allow folks to access the kind of professional development that we want them to. I'll just keep on going. Um, the next point um, is related to the 12 new level one beds at the Brattleboro Retreat. Um, in FY20, the legislature did appropriate funds for the 12 new level one beds to open in the fourth quarter of FY20. Um, which we were delayed from there as well. Um, COVID obviously um, impacting uh, the state uh, in mid-March. Obviously the construction of the beds at the Brattleboro Retreat had to come to a halt uh, for safety purposes. Um, the construction of those beds has resumed. Um, the anticipated opening of the 12 new level one beds is now January 1st, 2021 the Department of Mental Health and BGS and the retreat work in close collaboration to monitor the ongoing construction. It is back on track. It is moving very smoothly. Um, so this essentially uh, reflects um, the reduction to our budget uh, because of the delayed start of the opening of the 12 level one beds, uh, which is a gross total of $2.5 million. 
The next area is related to uh, suicide prevention. Um, so in the FY21 governor's recommended budget, um, there was $575,000 for suicide prevention. Um, the Department of Mental Health is going to utilize CRF and carry forward funds for our suicide prevention efforts. Um, the Joint Fiscal Committee um, did approve uh, a $500,000 allocation in CRF funds for suicide wow. prevention efforts going forward. Um, as many on this committee are aware, we did apply for a SAMHSA Emergency Suicide Prevention Grant. We were not awarded that grant, so per Act 136, Section 9, um, we do have um, the allotment of the CRF funds as well as uh, the department will utilize uh, carry forward funds from the previous fiscal year to ensure that programming can continue through all of FY21, um, given that the CRF funds, as we know now, will need to be expended um, by December of 2020. Um, I did wanna talk a little bit about what we're targeting some of our suicide prevention efforts on. Um, it's quite exciting. We've been able to actually lean in and develop some areas that we had hoping to do. Um, our first strategy, of course, is continuing to expand the zero suicide model in Vermont. Um, we also wanna continue to expand the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. I would also just note for the committee's edification um, that the federal government has approved a three-digit number um, for the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, um, which will really increase um, expedited access um, to emergency care um, and resources related to the Suicide Prevention Lifeline. We are also um, articulating funds uh, to develop targeted suicide prevention resources that are culturally informed to reach identified at-risk populations. Um, really leaning into some work related to the LGBTQ population. We've actually already started some really mm -hmm. exciting work with Outright Vermont, um, who is helping us with some training um, broadly across the mental health system. We wanna continue that, um, focusing on racial minorities, older Vermonters, and domestic violence victims. Um, so some of those funds will be utilized um, to develop specific materials and outreach to those groups. We're also very excited to be looking at expanding mental health first aid. Um, we've done a tremendous job in Vermont with mental health first aid, and we want to expand the teen program. Mental health first aid has a component that is focused on teens um, and public schools, uh, so we'll be utilizing some of that funding to focus on that as well. Um, and then, of course, we want to continue to focus on older Vermonters, um, who we know are very vulnerable um, we're already experiencing isolation prior to COVID. Um, so now more than ever, uh, we need to ensure that we are doing targeted outreach and suicide prevention work. Um, that work will be done in collaboration with the Department of Aging and Independent Living. I would also just note for the committee, um, one other opportunity um, that we are excited about um, is that we did apply uh, for a five-year grant uh, with VDH through the CDC. Um, it's a comprehensive suicide prevention grant. Uh, we should know again within the next couple of weeks um, if we are uh, successful recipients of that grant. Um, if we do receive that five-year grant, it would be an incredible opportunity for Vermont um, to really invest in some sustainable long-term infrastructure related to suicide prevention. Uh, so certainly I will keep uh, both committees apprised of any information that we receive uh, related to that CDC grant. Thank you, Sarah. Could we stop here for a minute? I have a, a question from Representative Lanfer. And, and members of the, um, of the House Health Care Committee, if you have questions, just raise your virtual hand and we'll try to stop um, in between testimony. Diane? So, oh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just on the suicide prevention. Um, so we heard from the, I don't know if it was the Agency of Agriculture, but during some of the CRF conversations that there was a, there was, there was an increase in suicide among farmers because of the pressure in, in that, that sector of industry. I was just wondering if, if that was included in one of your at-risk populations or yeah, sort of a... It's a great question. Um, it isn't um, specifically articulated here. I've had had um, some meetings um, 
uh, with folks from agriculture to see how the Department of Mental Health can continue to assist and support of farmers in the state. Um, when we look at our statewide averages related to suicide, we look at five-year averages. Um, we did have a slight uptick um, in the April period. Uh, things have stabilized and we are currently below the five-year average overall. Um, but certainly we want to continue to partner um, with the Agency of Agriculture. Um, and if there are any of these opportunities that we've articulated here that we could also leverage um, to support those groups, um, that's something that we're actively working on. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Sarah. Of course. Let's continue if I, I don't see other questions at this time. Okay, um, so the next section um, really highlights um, one-time CRF expenditures um, and that therefore uh, be, being able to leverage those CRF funds does result in overall savings. Um, so this represents expenditures related to COVID-19 at the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital and the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence, as well as we're able to attribute some of the costs of our medical director um, who works on the Health Operations Center. So essentially the department will utilize CRF funds for these COVID related expenditures. Um, and therefore that offsets the need um, for uh, global commitment dollars, uh, federal dollars and general fund, thus resulting in the savings uh, that you see reflected here. Um, I would also just note overall, the overall dollar need for these expenditures is $1.9 million. We already had $1.3 million as coronavirus relief fund carry forward that we're going to utilize, um, leaving the total CRF need of $559,000. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what some of these expenses were. Um, the first one is related to overtime pay at VPCH and MTCR for, at, for 12 hour shifts. Um, when COVID uh, hit the state and impacted the state, um, obviously that it had a significant impact on our staffing um, for good reasons, for reasons that staff needed uh, to be out for their own personal reasons, safety reasons, et cetera. Uh, so to manage this shortage, we did implement 12 hour shifts um, at our facilities, uh, which really, it, it's actually an industry standard in general, um, but it really allowed us to maximize staffing. Uh, the way that we were able to negotiate that with the VSCA is that there is some overtime that is built into that. Um, so that is through November 7th, 2020. Um, so that's a big chunk of what <clears throat> these expenditures are. We also had uh, the premium pay for face-to-face -face work. Um, for individuals who are employed at EPCH and MTCR. And then we do rely on uh, travel nurses uh, for our work at VPCH and MTCR. As you can imagine, um, as COVID was really impacting the healthcare systems across the country, mm -hmm. the demand for travel nurses went up significantly and therefore the cost went up. Um, so we are using uh, some of the CRF funds um, to cover the increased cost uh, to pay for those travel nurses. Um, but that is, that is the summary of the section and those one-time CRF expenditures, uh, which are resulting um, in some savings due to our ability to utilize that funding source. Uh, thank you, sir. I'm looking for questions and I, I don't see any at this time. So I think we can continue. And we'll probably have more questions at, at the end. Of course. Uh, so the, the next area, this reflects um, our work to uh, stand up a COVID positive uh, capacity within the system of care, uh, working with the Wyndham Center and Springfield Hospital. Um, I would just note that this is primarily FEMA dollars. Um, almost all of it is FEMA dollars um, with a little bit of coronavirus relief funds. Um, as this, these committees are aware, um, the need for capacity for COVID positive patients uh, became a significant priority. Uh, we had convened all of our inpatient providers and hospital providers across the state. Um, this is the recommendation of that network of providers. Um, this facility has been able to provide 
uh, capacity for individuals um, who are COVID positive. Um, and we really wanted to ensure that any individual who is presenting in an ED, even if they were COVID positive, could have access to timely care. Um, so we've been working very closely um, with the Wyndham Center. Um, this funding represents our you know, cost to contract with them um, to maintain that capacity. We also were able to utilize the FEMA dollars to upgrade um, the Wyndham facility. Uh, the Wyndham Center is a 10 bed inpatient facility. Um, and typically and historically, uh, they have really admitted um, or focused their care on voluntary patients. Um, so in order to ensure that they could safely and therapeutically care for higher acuity patients, we did need to make some upgrades um, to the facility, which we also utilized um, the funding for. Um, it's been an incredible partnership and it has been critical um, for those individuals who are presenting in an emergency department who are COVID positive to get them timely access to care. This is uh, funded through um, the end of December. We will obviously, as a state, as a system, we're continuing to evaluate the impact of COVID. We'll continue to evaluate the need for this capacity um, to have COVID positive capacity. You know, as we continue to move towards recovery, um, we wanna make sure that we continue to be proactive. Um, and at the point where we as systems partners determine that we no longer need a COVID positive uh, unit, you know, the Wyndham Center unit can just revert back um, to a traditional inpatient unit. And then we've obviously upgraded the facility as well, um, you know, which um, is an asset um, for the mental health system of care. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions on the Wyndham Center Springfield? Uh, Representative Donahue? Thank you. Um, I was just wondering what the current census is of that unit. They currently do not, we do not have any COVID positive patients right now. Thank you. Did you have a follow up, Ann, or does that satisfy your question? So, does that mean there are no patients in that facility? That's correct. Yeah, thank you. Representative Lippert? Is, is that facility fully staffed at this time? Yes, yeah, so they've been able to maintain their staffing. That's part of the capacity payment um, that we provide to them because obviously we want to ensure um, that they have adequate staffing. While some of the upgrades to the facility have been made, um, they actually utilize their staffing to support individuals who are COVID positive um, in, they have a two bed ED unit that they were utilizing um, in the short term. Um, so those Wyndham Center staff have been kind of at the ready uh, to provide uh, care and treatment. And again, we'll continue to evaluate this need um, and continue to evaluate um, how long we might want to ensure that we have this COVID positive capacity. Could I ask the number of staff that are that are in this unit? That is a great question. I don't know that I have the staffing grid numbers off the top of my head, um, but we could certainly get that to the committee as a follow-up representative poll, if that's okay with you. If there are no individuals being served at that time and the staff are there, do they have other duties that they're assigned? Yes, my understanding, um, and I guess I would I would have to defer um, to the, the CEO of Springfield Hospital um, that they are utilizing those staff, you know, in other capacities as needed. Um, and again, you know, it's been really fascinating to watch the trends in our inpatient mental health system. You know, things ebb and flow very quickly, um, and you know, we had a period of time, you know, just you know, about a month and a half ago where we saw a significant uptick in individuals presenting um, in EDs. Uh, we saw a little bit of an uptick in COVID positive patients. Now things have, the pendulum has swung back again to where we only have three to four individuals waiting in an ED on a daily basis. Um, so I think Springfield is doing the best they can to maintain adequate staffing. And I'm sure they're trying to utilize those staff as efficiently as possible in other areas. 
Thank you. And Representative Lippert, I jumped in there. Did you have a follow up? No, I was asking, I was interested in similarly. And, and actually, I'd be interested, have we, do you know what the total census uh, or census, the number of patients who were COVID positive who needed to access that facility? Has it, yeah. has it, pro has it proven to be a needed facility, knowing that we needed to anticipate it, but has it actually shown us to be needed? Yes, we have had uh, two COVID positive patients. Um, and, you know, this is, this is the challenge. Um, you know, we need to have the capacity because if we don't have it, you know, it is, it is from my perspective, not okay for an individual to wait in an ED uh, for a long period of time if we don't have the capacity. Um, we're going to have to, you know, continue to evaluate that. I think having this capacity has allowed us um, to preserve and maintain um, a great infection control with some of our larger facilities, such as VPCH and the Brattleboro Retreat. Um, so again, it's something that we're going to have to continue um, to monitor as we go forward um, to see if, you know, we need to continue to have this capacity. Do we need it on a smaller scale? How best do we manage infection control? Um, how do we carve out you know, that capacity separately if it needs to be smaller? Um, those are all things that we're continuing to evaluate. Thank you. Uh, Representative Christensen. Yes, um, the, it, the facility has been upgraded and when, when we hope COVID will pass, what will that facility be used for? Is that earmarked for that? Or do those upgraded facilities go back to Springfield Hospital for their use? Oh, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, the upgrades have really significantly, I don't know if any of you have toured the Wyndham Center. Um, it's a lovely 10 bed unit. Um, it was older. Um, it did not have all of um, the updated uh, safety and therapeutic, uh, you know, physical attributes that we would like to see, um, which is why um, we actually, at a point in time, the Department of Mental Health um, was not sending involuntary patients to the Wyndham Center because we didn't feel it had adequate um, physical capacity to keep individuals safe. Um, so with the improvements that have been made to the facility post COVID or whenever we determine um, that having this COVID unit is no longer necessary, we've increased the capacity of the Wyndham Center uh, to accept and treat higher acuity patients in a safer and more therapeutic environment. Representative Christensen, did you have a, a follow-up? I'm going to move to Representative Donahue. Thank you. And I think this probably is a question to raise now, but uh, to get the response um, maybe too much in detail right now. But um, I, I noticed that you include in the potential uh, patients for the unit, those who are refusing COVID-19 uh, testing in the ED. But my understanding is also that, of course, all uh, inpatients uh, are required to be tested in the ED prior to admission. And we all know that there is a delay in time uh, for getting results. So um, I would be interested in knowing the amount of those delays and how long people are staying in the ED and whether or not they could be transferred to make use of this rather than staying in the ED um, without, um, without supports. And, how that impacts our ED delays as a whole. Again, not, not for now. Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Representative Donahue, and I appreciate it very much. Um, we're happy to follow up. We did put um, expedited testing protocols in place um, by working uh, with UVM um, and with VDH um, so that psychiatric patients were prioritized. We even put into place an expedited career service um, to ensure that the COVID testing um, did not add to wait times. Um, I, and I think that has gone actually fairly smoothly. Um, I do think the individuals who um, are refusing COVID testing, which is not to be unexpected for someone who might be presenting in an ED, 
Um, that is where we have experienced um, longer than desirable wait times. Um, so certainly something that we're thinking about um, in terms of how we continue to utilize um, the Wyndham Center. But you know, we're happy to follow up with, with more detail um, on that um, as well. Thank you, because my under, my understanding is that the policy itself discriminates um, against people who are there voluntarily in terms of the expedited uh, protocols. So it, it only it is only required for involuntary patients, and others may be waiting longer. Mm -hmm. So again, we can wait yeah. on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Uh, and Representative Cordes. Thank you. I would just um, like to add that. Uh, the University of Vermont Medical Center latest policy about testing is that at least um, for most of the units that I'm familiar with, um, we no longer require um, testing prior to admission. So uh, we, do, um, we do test everyone, but it doesn't preclude their admission onto our units. Thank you. Thank you for that information. Um, Sarah, did you want to respond or that really wasn't a question, it was? Yeah, our um, current understanding is that all inpatient units, including UVM are requiring COVID testing. So based on the representative's comments, um, we'll follow up on that uh, just because that is certainly the protocol that we've been following. Um, and that's the guidance that's come out from VDH related to um, inpatient psychiatric units. So we'll be sure to follow up. I guess I'll just clarify. It means it doesn't stop the admission onto the unit um, when before we couldn't admit them onto our unit until we had COVID results. Um, and now that's not the case. Thank so I think Mara. we're still... No, I didn't mean to cut you off. Could you please finish? Oh, that, that was it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, I think we have three small pieces left and then we can go into, uh, before we move into a broader discussion, if there's a couple of pieces from the January uh, proposal uh, regarding um, uh, residential youth, I believe, and uh, funds to the Brattleboro retreat. And I don't know if you're prepared to talk about the the, the earlier proposals that would still be on the table. Um, uh, sure, I'm happy to do that. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So let's just finish up this and then those would be a couple of the pieces. And I don't know if there's more that you would like to comment on that were part of the governor's um, January proposal. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll get through these small pieces. There was one area I wanted to highlight, and then I'll circle back to the original um, FY21 budget uh, recommend. Um, so related to uh, the three additional areas, next one is fairly straightforward using Sierra funding for laptops for telework use uh, for some of our staff um, who shifted obviously to telework um, and are continuing to telework during COVID. Um, and the next two areas are, are good news for the department and for our budget um, in terms of CARES revenue uh, that the Durant Psychiatric Care Hospital received. Um, so on July 14th, um, we were notified uh, by the Department of Health and Human Services that we would be receiving $1.9 million as part of CARES Act funding. Um, this is a payment because we are an acute care hospital and considered a specialty rural provider. Um, so good news for us to have an additional $1.9 million. Um, that is a grant to support overall operational costs, which obviously supports our budget as well. And then earlier in the year in April, um, we received additional CARES revenue um, that was focused on Medicare. Um, and they must have had some formula behind the scenes that they utilized. It was an automatic payment um, to us uh, related to uh, Medicare patients, and that was $106,000. Thank you. We, we like that good news for the general fund. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> it is good news. Um, so well, I did want to, oh, go ahead. Oh, well, if you had something else, and then I wanted to move to the other initiatives that are still um, uh, part of the governor's proposal from January, when, when, when you're finished with this piece. Yeah, one thing that I, I did want to recommend that I am uh, sure um, either of the committees might comment on um, is mobile response. 
Um, so in the FY21, um, governors recommend uh, there was um, originally one-time funding um, to pilot mobile response in one region in our state. Um, you will notice that that is not part of our um, current FY21 um, recommend. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, mobile response remains a significant and important initiative um, that we feel strongly will continue to provide more proactive supports in the home and in the community. And right now, our community mental health system um, continues to grapple with the impact of COVID and we're trying to really stabilize that system um, as it currently stands. Uh, so from an implementation standpoint, um, I think it would be wise for us um, right now um, to continue to stabilize and support our community mental health partners who are still struggling with the same kind of staffing issues, um, trying to provide care in a different way, um, and look to move forward potentially with a pilot of mobile response um, in the future. Um, Rutland Mental Health was the identified pilot region for this, if folks will recall. Um, that was a data driven, driven decision um, because the Rutland area had the highest ED utilization rate um, for children and youth. Um, in conversations with leadership from Rutland Mental Health, they are actually moving forward um, with some very exciting initiatives related to their emergency services. They're actually moving their emergency services team to a more central location um, in the community in Rutland. Um, they've received a mobile response van as one of our other grants that we provided to them that we received from COVID. Um, and they're really trying to shore up kind of a foundation um, for a mobile response model that I think we can build upon as we go forward. Um, certainly in speaking with leadership from Rutland, you know, as we move into, you know, the January time period, um, we'll continue to evaluate, you know, is that the right time um, to assess and implement um, mobile response? So, I just wanted to note that it is also one of the priorities um, and part of um, an, an action area in our 10-year plan. I also think as the Mental Health Integration Council um, starts to meet um, in October, uh, this will be another you know, priority policy area that the Mental Health Integration Council can also focus on as well. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I you know, kind of explained to the committees um, what our thinking was related to mobile response um, still an urgent priority, but we want to make sure it's the right implementation time um, for that pilot so that it's successful. Thank you, Sarah. Of course. So I can... Um, a question from Representative Jessup. Yeah, uh, thank you. Commissioner, um, in Middlesex, uh, the facility there was used by DCF for a while, and I'm assuming that it's now reverted to uh, use again by Department of Mental Health for the same purposes and is that capacity, is that correct? Yes, so the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence, um, when we were trying to manage staffing shortages uh, at VPCH and MTCR, we did move the individuals from MTCR um, to one of the units at VPCH. Um, during that time period, the Middlesex facility was open um, DCF was obviously grappling with um, some challenges related to Woodside. They occupied um, that facility for a short period of time. Um, the facility is now um, reopened. Uh, folks are also aware we had some water quality issues that we had to address. So we have a new water filtration system um, that has been installed. All the water quality results um, have been very positive. So the water filtration system is doing its job. Um, and we are anticipating to move the residents um, from Middlesex, uh, from VPCH back to the Middlesex location um, in the next three to four weeks is the current plan. And is there anything you care to comment now about uh, what might be the future cooperative efforts with the Central Vermont Medical Center? Representative Jessup, are you referring to the previous plans around expanding inpatient capacity? Yes. Yes. Um, well, as we all know, um, the planning uh, related um, to uh, additional 25 inpatient beds was put on hold um, during COVID as the UVM Health Network was 
um, managing the impact. My assumption would be that um, at some point that work uh, will resume, that planning will resume, um, but I have not had those conversations um, with leadership um, at Central Vermont Medical Center yet. Right, thank you. Of course. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, there were a couple other changes um, in January. Do you want to highlight those, Sarah, and then we'll open up for questions? Sure. Um, I am diving back into the original FY21 uh, budget submission. I guess I will focus on, you know, maybe what would feel most significant and certainly can dig into some of the smaller pieces as well um, based on the committee's interest. Um, but certainly children's residential is an area that is a consistent budget pressure um, for us. Uh, we certainly continue to see an increase in acuity in the clinical needs um, for children and youth related to residential care. Um, it's increased challenges related to, um, you know, parental mental health challenges, difficulty managing behaviors. Anyone who has spent time with the youth risk behavior survey data, you know, we're clearly seeing significant trends um, in depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation. Um, so overall, we continue um, to see an increased demand for residential services. Um, we also have a core team here uh, between DMH, Dale, and DCF that really focuses on um, residential care. Uh, we produce quarterly reports that look at um, children and youth who are placed in state, children and youth who are placed out of state. Obviously, our, our goal is to reduce the need um, for residential care. Um, but the past few years, we still continue to see this um, as a, a potential, you know, pressure on our budget um, and just a continued um, need in general. I would also add um, that part of our children's residential cost um, is, uh, and Shannon, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, the Howard Center, um, which is the Jarrett House, which is a crisis stabilization bed, um, also falls under this bucket of funding. Um, so certainly that's, that's a critical program um, where we need to maintain capacity. Um, so that's an additional cost that is represented um, as part of this residential, what we refer to as PNMI funding bucket. The other, um, Two that I will note, these were BAA items, um, but I'm sure that that was, feels like quite a long time ago. Um, you know, did want to know that we had some increases um, related to level one costs. Um, so our level one uh, bed capacity um, at the Brattleboro Retreat, as well as Rutland Regional Medical Center. Um, as many are aware, Act 79 requires reasonable actual reimbursement of costs for level one hospitals. We have a cost settlement process that we go through to ensure that their costs are covered. Um, that is reconciled. Um, so we had an estimated um, gross increase on level one costs as well. Thank you. Yes, and the other two... The other one that I would note was just, folks will recall that um, we did put into place um, rate increases uh, for the Brattleboro Retreat. Um, DMH is responsible to ensure the payment of inpatient care um, for folks who are eligible for CRT services. Um, so this was a BAA item, um, but those inpatient rate increases were also uh, reflected um, in the original FY21 governor recommend. So those, um, for the chair, those were the ones that jumped out at me um, as areas from the FY21 budget, the original budget that I wanted to highlight for the committees. Thank you, Sarah. Are there any from either appropriations or, or house health care committee members that they would like to ask the commissioner or the CFO at this time? Uh, Representative Lippert. Yes, I'm. Uh, so help me out if I'm not understanding where we are in this process. Uh, is there? So what we've just reviewed is the ups and downs uh, from the budget, uh, but we haven't reviewed all of the underlying budget. Am I correct with that? 
the existing budget. These are um, these are uh, any new initiatives um, would be in the governor's proposal uh, that created ups and downs, but the right. underlying programs that haven't been highlighted would be remain as as existing. So I, I guess I want to just ask a question because I don't have that underlying budget in my mind fully. Mm -hmm. uh, is that underlying budget include any increases for the designated agencies or the related agencies in terms of funding for staffing, et cetera? It does not currently include any increases um, to the designated agencies for staffing. Um, there are some tertiary increases in terms of like the increased funding um, for PNMI, um, which like for example, the Howard Center um, has uh, some of those programs, but there are no additional increases. So essentially, so I mean, I think that's important for us to understand in terms of the work that we had done over a period of years to try to recognize that uh, we can't sustain the community mental health system by level funding it. That's a statement, Bill. I'm, I'm, it's a statement and a okay. question in terms of do we anticipate reductions in the capacity of the community system based on our not being able to provide any additional funding? Sarah, would you like to comment? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, well, certainly um, we value our community mental health partners and the incredible work that they do on a daily basis. Um, we, as this committees are aware, we worked very hard when COVID hit to ensure that we stabilized them. Uh, because essentially when, when COVID impacted Vermont, services couldn't be provided in the same way that they were before. Um, so because we had already implemented payment reform um, within DMH, that provided us with a lot of flexibility so we could continue those prospective payments to our designated community mental health agencies um, so that even if their volume of service was different, the amount of people that they're providing services to was different, they were still receiving the same amount of funding. Um, I think the impact of COVID has certainly impacted the capacity of our system. And I think across our continuum of care, um, we continue to focus on trying to rebuild that, to have more community-based services um, that keeps everyone safe. Um, the only other point that I would add um, is certainly um, AHS is in the lead on the healthcare stabilization package. Um, so prior to that, we had actually, myself and Commissioner Hutt, um, had worked very hard to ensure that we had additional funding to the designated agencies and SSAs for Hazard K. Um, you'll recall, I think they received about $7 million um, in additional funding um, for that. Um, and there was the initial um, additional um, relief, coronavirus relief that they could apply for. And now that the healthcare stabilization package is out, um, the designated agencies and specialized service agencies are also applying for any lost revenue or COVID impact um, during that time period. Um, so I do feel like right now uh, we are absolutely prioritizing our community mental health agencies and ensuring that they have adequate funding um, to be able to rebuild and continue to do their work. If I may, just a quick follow-up. Uh, can you remind me, because I honestly don't remember, uh, in terms of the payment reform with the uh, designated agencies, is there a true up at some point in time in terms of any type of uh, recognition that they either didn't have the same capacity or is there any kind of true up or is it is the payment reform uh, provided to them regardless of the ups and downs in um, actual patient numbers? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, and certainly um, as we look at you know, payment refer reform, alternative payment models. Of course, we need to continue to monitor volume of services, quality of services, et cetera. Um, during COVID, we also have a lot of flexibility um, so that we're not penalizing <laughs> agencies uh, because their numbers are going down or shifting. Um, so yes, there's accountability. Um, during this COVID period, we have a lot of flexibility from CMS 
um, to continue to support the agencies, um, given that their volume and how they're providing services is different. Okay, so they're, they're, they don't need to anticipate during this period a, I don't know, clawback's not the right term, but a, essentially a true up where they will get a bill for services not rendered. No. Okay, that's helpful to understand. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Bill. Uh, we have a question from Representative Donahue and then uh, Yacovoni. Anne? Thank you. Um, I, I, I think this, uh, the um, the the comparison between what the original budget proposal had been in terms of ups or downs, and the current is probably something we'll need to uh, mm -hmm. get a better understanding and, and maybe more of a side by side. Um, but specifically, um, in terms of suicide prevention, um, my recollection is that there were some initiatives in the original uh, budget proposal for increases in that area. And then separately, there was the, uh, uh, the COVID grant uh, supplemental um, initiatives that if the grant didn't come through, we were gonna seek to replace with CFR. Um, I, I think it would be helpful for us to understand uh, which things were part of the original proposal uh, which were the supplemental initiatives and which have ended up now in the budget proposal as CFR funding, but are, uh, is no longer resources being proposed uh, as part of the, the regular budget. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Representative Donahue. Um, so our original um, overall funding proposal um, for our suicide prevention efforts was the $575,000. Um, that included um, expanding zero suicide, um, continuing to expand the Vermont National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, um, as well as um, expanding programs and supports for older Vermonters. Uh, because we are able to leverage CRF funds and potentially utilize our carry forward funds to continue this work, we were actually able to add initiatives that we felt were urgent and important um, given the impact of COVID. So the additional items that we are now able to implement is um, the targeted suicide prevention resources that I mentioned, um, really focusing on at-risk groups, um, culturally informed resources and outreach. I mentioned the LGBTQ community, um, racial minorities, um, and domestic violence victims. Um, we were also able to add the expansion to um, the mental health first aid training to focus on the teens. Um, we are very concerned um, about our young Vermonters um, expanding mental health um, first aid um, for teens um, is a kind of a national policy recommendation. So we're also using funding to advance that as well. Thank you. I just, I, I think it'll be helpful, not today, but um, soon to get a, a side by side of, of the, what would have been if we received what we hoped for, because clearly um, it's, it's half or less of what the funding uh, would have been if we had both the original budget proposal and the uh, COVID grant that was uh, supposed to be replaced by CFR funding if we didn't get the grant, um, which we didn't get. So I, I, I'm not looking for a response right now, which will be a uh, higher level as you just gave, but we need to, to see what actually got dropped out that we, um, we, we were hoping for. Of course. Of course. And then we, again, as I yeah, mentioned, the five-year CDC grant um, would just be an incredible opportunity for us as a state. Um, so we'll certainly keep the committee apprised of that as well. Um, but we can put together that side-by-side -side representative Donahue and get it out to the committees to reflect on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have representative Iacovoni and then Fagan and Lamper. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sir, could you speak to your understanding or give us a status report on the success beyond six services that typically are provided by our designated agencies? Do you, do you have the expectation that, that those services will continue as they have previously in a remote learning environment in our schools? Thank you. 
Yes, thank you, Representative Iacovoni. Um, I appreciate the question very much. Um, so just to kind of back up for this committee to understand, um, Success Beyond Six uh, was actually created in 1992. Um, it's a fiscal and policy mechanism um, that allows our local education agencies, our LEAs, to contract with the designated agencies for mental health services for children. Um, and what's unique about it is that we utilize local education dollars to essentially draw down Department of Mental Health Medicaid. Um, so it's a really effective fiscal mechanism um, because essentially it allows local schools to provide match dollars at 60 cents on the dollar. That's not totally accurate, but to draw down um, the DMH Medicaid. Um, so it's just been an incredible program. Um, I actually ran school-based mental health services for over a decade um, and certainly can speak to the power of that work um, and how much it supports um, children, youth, and families. When COVID hit, um, we, of course, the Department of Mental Health wanted to ensure um, that school-based mental health services would continue. Um, we know that for many children and youth, school is their most nourishing environment where they access some of their most trusted and safe relationships. Um, so we at the Department of Mental Health immediately um, put into place an emergency case rate um, for school-based mental health, wanting to maintain the capacity of the DA system and wanting to ensure that those funds um, could continue to flow. What we did not anticipate um, was that uh, the um, flexibility that we have under our mental health Medicaid um, is not shared by the flexibility of the Agency of Education funding. Um, so it created this immediate tension point um, by which we were trying to provide funding for capacity, the provision of services looking very different, and the local LEAs found themselves in a position of really only being able to or being willing to pay um, kind of as a fee for service model. So just continuing to pay for the direct care. So it, it, it created a little bit of a, a kerfuffle, um, if you will. Um, so we immediately um, and have been working um, in good faith with the Agency of Education, um, with our uh, local LEAs and special um, education directors to try to, to problem solve around this um, because we at the Department of Mental Health are very committed to ensuring that this program uh, remains intact, um, that we continue to do outreach um, to children, youth, and families. Um, we know that remote learning has created even more anxiety um, for our youngest Vermonters. Um, so we really want to ensure that we can continue to do that. Um, so the current work that we're doing right now, we have a group of individuals from the Agency of Education, DMH, local LEAs, and the DAs um, that meet regularly. I think there have been five meetings so far. Uh, we have six action areas that we're trying to address um, to really shore this up. Um, in the short term, um, it's my understanding that currently the local LEAs and the DAs are looking at short-term contracts. <laughs> Um, kind of 30 to 90 days to try to get through, you know, this first kind of reopening of schools, which is a hybrid model, um, to try to create some flexibility. So if services need to look different or provided differently, that the LEAs still feel like they can use special ed dollars to do that. Um, part of that is also directly related to how contracts are written um, to ensure that they kind of, I guess, articulate the scope of services and how they might be delivered differently. Um, the documentation on the IEPs for the children and youth is also critical um, because that is what directly ties back to the local education agency's ability to get funding um, from the agency of education. So many of those IEPs don't necessarily reflect um, how services might be provided differently. They might be provided remotely. Um, so there's a lot of kind of technical work behind the scenes that needs to happen to ensure our respective funding sources align um, and that this work um, can continue. Um, so that work is underway. We you know, have a separate PowerPoint that kind of summarizes um, that work to date. If that would be helpful for the committee, I'm happy to share that um, myself and Secretary Smith also um, met um, 
with um, uh, Secretary French yesterday and Deputy Secretary Boucher. Um, so it is on everyone's radar, you know, to find a solution and a path forward. Um, and I think we've made a significant amount of progress, you know, over the past month. Um, but, you know, we, we still have some work to do. The other thing I would just note um, is that part of the healthcare stabilization uh, relief fund, the designated agencies um, can apply for lost revenue related to success beyond six um, as well, just to also provide them um, some relief. Uh, so that's a, well, probably was no quick summary, but that's a summary of where success beyond six currently stands. Yes, Sarah. I, I appreciate that. And if I may share, if I could just a quick uh, follow up. Um, are you confident that the LEAs are getting the guidance and direction they need to be able to make this work? I think they are getting the guidance. I think the Agency of Education um, has been working very hard to provide guidance. Um, the interpretation of that guidance. Um, is also unique to that supervisory union. Um, so you have um, special ed folks, you have legal folks from supervisory unions that are interpreting the guidance differently. Um, so I think that has also been something that we've been trying to clarify um, is how to help um, the local LEAs interpret that guidance accurately and more consistently across the state. Okay, I'll be following on this. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Dave. Um, I think from here we went to um, Representative Fagan, and I did forget Representative Hooper, who can't put her hand up. We have Lamphere and um, uh, Representative Lippert. And we uh, have about 10 minutes left of this discussion. Um, Peter, you're up, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for coming in. Uh, you've answered a lot of my questions regarding the Healthcare Stabilization Coronavirus Relief Fund of $275 million we passed in relation to DAs and the SSAs. Um, are they accessing it for more than just success beyond six? And can we um, get information as to what they are accessing it for, please? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. Um, as other healthcare providers, um, there are several areas that they can apply for that are eligible um, whether it's revenue losses or additional expenses, costs of PTE, et cetera. Um, I don't believe that we have, for the previous tranche of funding, um, that wasn't necessarily specific information that we shared. Um, the current process and is still underway. Um, so certainly I could take it back to AHS um, in terms of if and how that information might be communicated. Um, and I can see Sarah Clark just unmuted herself, so she might have a thought there as well. And in keeping with what I always state, if this has got to be reinvented, if somebody's got to invent the wheel to be able to give, get us this information, please tell me and I'll back away from my question. I was just going to say that um, the agency actually just submitted uh, an update report to the legislature on the status of this program. So you'll be able to find a, a bit more information there. As uh, Sarah, Commissioner Squirrel indicated, um, the, the first round of applications just closed on the 15th. And so we're kind of in the process of evaluating and preparing to issue grant awards. So there'll be a lot more information available to you in the next three to four weeks. Thank you. I did scan the report and, and that was part of the reason why I'm asking the question. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, Representative Lamford. Thank you. So one of the one of the joys that we have is to be able to get sit in a place where we hear all of the different budgets and and as you present uh, talking about the mental health issues and, and some of the supports around that, and I'm not always familiar with everything, but a couple of days ago when the Agency of Education was in and they presented their their proposal for reductions, their 3% reduction in grants, one of them that they indicated is that they reduced the outright Vermont grant by $40,000. And I'm not sure how that impacts the mental health support that would kind of tag up with what um, the Department of Mental Health is working on. I don't know if you can speak to that at all. And I know like the relationship between AOE and 
highlighted it just now, but that, that just came to mind that that reduction is in their proposal and I don't know what it means for you. Thanks. Yeah, I wasn't, thank you, Representative Lamphere. I wasn't even aware that there was funding going from AOE to outright Vermont. Um, we, as I mentioned, we're actually using some of our um, mental health block grant funds um, to provide funding to outright Vermont um, to do some of the uh, training that I mentioned um, for our community mental health agencies across the state. They are also going to be a key partner and will receive some funding from our the suicide prevention work that we want to do. Um, so it's actually, it's a partner that the Department of Mental Health is actually looking to utilize more. Um, so I can only speak to the current funding that DMH is currently um, uh, utilizing to support their work and their expertise. Um, but that is you know, definitely something that we are working to advance and increase at this time. Diane, you're muted. Were you finished? Sorry, I just said thank you. Of course, you're welcome. Representative Hooper. Thank you. You can tell the House of Probes has all been sitting here together since most of my questions have been covered. I was going to ask about outright the DAs and the uh, success beyond six. But I, I wanted to dwell on the VA issue. So the other questions have been asked. And, um, but I am concerned about rate inc or the ability of, of the de designated agencies to continue their services if they do not see an increase in funding in the, in the coming year. Um, I, I have heard from my designated agency that they are not going to be able to offer any staff increase, uh, pay increases. So they're level funding their pay. Um, this is at a time when I think there's some on the order of about 30% below the rates that the state is able to pay and significantly below what privates pay. So I'm worried about our first line of defense um, I understand that notwithstanding the fabulous work that everybody has done around homelessness, we have an increase in homelessness in central Vermont. I'm guessing that's true elsewhere as families become more fragile because of income issues. And so I think we need to be increasing our capacity to provide services, not level funding it. And I'm wondering if you would comment on that, please. Yes, yeah, so certainly um, the capacity of our community mental health system um, is critical as we look across the system of care. I think we are all still continuing to get our arms around the impact of COVID. I think we are benefiting right now from the additional coronavirus relief funds that we are able to leverage. Um, again, we are using all of the flexibility um, within our case rate and payment reform um, to support the designated agencies. Um, so while their provision of services um, has changed significantly in some areas it has had to decrease, um, which we understand, um, we have continued to maintain full funding for them and to create that flexibility um, on the back end as well. I do think the success beyond six is unique because it's outside of the case rate. It's still a fee for service model and it's clear how problematic that is, um, which is why I guess I would also add in addition to the comments I made earlier, we are still committed to coming up with a case rate for success beyond six, um, which will help and will, you know, kind of continue, um, I think, to create, you know, that flexibility and sustainability. Um, so I think, you know, across our system of care, you know, we'll have to, you know, to continue to look at the needs of all of our providers across the state um, and then balance that against, you know, where is Vermont economically in terms of our, our recovery. I appreciate that, and you, you stated that we've been able to re, re, maintain full funding for the DAs, and I just want to highlight again that that means level funding for them in a time when there is huge competition for their services, let alone the stress of it. And 
I, I think this is where we need to be making the investments. Like the upstream investments are so much more, I, they're all important, but the more we can do there, the less expensive it is. So I, I hope the healthcare committee can maybe drill into this a little bit more and see if we need to shift how we're making those investments. I don't know if we can do it in this budget, but going forward, thank you. Thank you, Representative Hooper. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Representative Lippert. I wanted to uh, just clarify uh, in terms of the, the, one of the ongoing very difficult issues is the wait times in our emergency departments and hospitals for psychiatric uh, care, inpatient psychiatric care. And if I understand from what you've said that with the movement of, so what my question is twofold, one, if there's the move, movement of patients from PCMH back to the Millsex facility, will that increase capacity uh, at PCMH for additional admissions? Uh, and and secondly, so that's that's one issue. I'm trying to see where the capacity is and where it can increase. And in terms of the diff, the Brattleboro retreat, the 12 additional beds, uh, is the January 1st, 2021 deadline a deadline for completion of construction or is that is that a January 1 deadline where admissions can begin at the Brattleboro retreat for those 12 additional beds because staffing will be in place etc right um, so I'll start with the first question representative Liftbert which is just generally capacity across our inpatient system of care um, when COVID initially hit, um, we had, you know, a little bit of a, an eerie silence, if you will, um, in terms of just a general decrease um, in individuals presenting in EDs. Obviously, our inpatient system was also grappling with staffing shortages, um, double occupancy rooms, having to shift to single occupancy rooms overnight for infection control purposes. Um, so slowly over time, we have been rebuilding our inpatient capacity. I would let the committee know that across the system, we're running at anywhere from between, you know, 60 and 90% capacity across our inpatient units. And um, I guess where the higher capacity is, is within our level one beds. Um, we, we've been able to maintain a high level, a fairly high level of capacity um, there. Uh, as I mentioned before, we did see a little bit we started to see a, an uptick um, in individuals presenting in the EDs for a brief period. And now again, that has tapered off again. Um, so we are continuing to keep our eye on it. Um, the Department of Mental Health uh, looks at wait time data very um, in depth. Uh, so I am waiting for our data and statistics team to get us the current data on wait times so we can really see and analyze where we are trending and what the impact of COVID had on those wait times. I just don't have that data yet. Um, in terms of the Brattleboro retreat, um, it is my understanding that the construction will be completed by January 1, um, that the retreat will of course be working on staffing and hiring prior to that. Um, so the goal would be as close to January 1 um, that admissions can begin as soon as possible. Um, obviously, there are many variables and factors there that the retreat will have to grapple with um, in terms of just, you know, ongoing staffing shortages across the state. Um, but the intent is that that capacity, uh, maybe not that full capacity, a full 12 bed unit um, will come online January 1st. Part of the action plan for sustainability related to the retreat as well is also continuing, you know, to monitor and ensure um, that those 12 level one beds are on time and on schedule. So that is certainly something um, that we are keeping a close eye on. Thank you. Bill, did you have a follow-up or? No, it's just a concern that uh, the, those deadlines keep moving. Uh, mm -hmm. And so what we intended for additional capacity uh, hasn't been able to materialize some of it understandably because of COVID, but I'm just, I, I, I think we need to keep an eye on that very closely because if that, if those 12 beds don't materialize, we really have an increased capacity. Thank you, Bill. 
Uh, we have a final question from Representative Donahue, and then I need a couple of minutes to tie up some loose ends and make sure that we're all on the same page going forward. So, Anne, your final question? Just a brief, um, again, request for follow-up information, not right now, but I think it would be helpful for us to have um, a, a bed capacity uh, mm -hmm. comparison locations. And because we did, we did as part of the sustainability plan for the retreat, close a unit. So we have lost a certain number of beds mm -hmm. while we're also opening some. So I think having a, a clear picture of how many beds uh, prior and after um, at each of our hospitals would be um, useful background. Yes, of course, we can provide that. Thank you, Ann, and thank you, Sarah. So as we, um, as we um, move through these budgets and, and, and make our conclusions, and I, Sarah, first I wanna tell you, your presentation was excellent. It was, it was well presented, and easy to follow. So thank you very much. Of course. For your presentation. Um, but as we work through these and, and come to conclusion, we have to remember these are only the, the showing the delta, reflecting the delta from the governor's proposal in January. So if there are proposals that have not been changed um, or they have you know, not been delayed or anything that's happening to them, they're still on the table for consideration in that proposal. And so we are really faced with um, reviewing two documents at the same time, going back to the January document and then taking this new restated document and determining what's in, what's out, what's delayed, and what's still in place. And it's going to be tremendously uh, difficult um, to do it. So we have to understand the budget is not presented to us in one document. It's presented to us in the document from January and then this restated document. And so I would ask my members, um, when you're working with um, your agencies and departments, uh, to get a, a good handle on what has changed and what's still on the table that we need to consider that's impacting the budget. And uh, Sarah it is working on uh, helping us to identify some of these areas, but not just within AHS, but across the board, we're only seeing the changes. And so we really have to have in front of us the uh, proposal from January and then sort through all the changes ourselves um, because we're only seeing the Delta, we're not seeing what's still in place, which were the original proposals of the administration. So it's quite a task that we have ahead of us, but I'm sure that the administration um, will be helpful in helping us identify uh, what proposals are still, um, 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 you know, um, a priority uh, to them. And just a quick example, one that we would not see because there wasn't a change, uh, the Community High School of Vermont, there's a change that the funding would come from the Ed Fund. So that isn't in any of our presentation materials. That's something that's in the January materials that we would have to go through and pick up and see that that change is still in the proposal before us, even though we haven't seen it since uh, January and February. So I want to uh, thank you, uh, oh, Kitty. Can I just can I just just add one thing to that as well? Because when I'm looking at the January proposal, or at least in the crosswalks, they also indicate nicely in places where it's like budget adjustment (BAA). So when I'm looking at that, I'm making an assumption, which may be bad that all of those BAA, because it hadn't passed when they presented this to us originally back in January, that some of those may be different, maybe, we don't know. We don't, don't, know. Make, don't make any assumptions, we'll have right. to, and the Joint Fiscal Office will also help us with that. So okay. it's, it's a much larger task than a regular budget before us because it's coming in pieces. Um, so uh, thank you all, Sarah, and uh, your team for being here. Uh, Bill, Mary uh, Hooper has this budget, and she'll be working directly with you. And as you take any additional testimony, if she could come in and sit and listen, that would be really helpful. And uh, the recommendations on this budget, if we could get them by the first or second. I know it's a very aggressive timeline, but I didn't set the timeline. The calendar is setting the timeline for us.